make sure. Okay, what did it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There. So Olga Livingston, I'm principal cyber economist at Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I've been there for about nine years. My background is mathematical economics and statistics. Um, so n nine years supporting cyber. Uh, prior to that, it was actually energy model at one of the national labs. So really appreciate the previous presentation. That, um, so dear beloved, we gathered here today at 2.30 on Friday <laughs> to talk about open source um, software and specifically what it is that CISA is doing in, with the open source. Why we're meddling or what are the equities, uh, what are the potential function and role. Uh, so <clears throat> the, um, the premise is that uh, open source uh, software is used widely through the economy. Uh, U.S. economy is innovation driven and open source software is foundation of that innovation and that's classic for macro. I'm, I'm also a junk professor teaching macro micro economics of information security at Virginia Tech. So it's one of the classical studies in macro as to what drives productivity, what drives uh, GDP growth, uh, specifically with the U.S. economy but other economies as well. And it's the innovation, it's R&D, but it's also commercialization and use of that innovation. And open source as an epitome is an example of that. Uh, so let's do this. Um, uh, open source is used in all critical infrastructure uh, sectors. Open source is used by federal government. Federal government is one of the largest global users of open source. So naturally, there should be a role for CISA in this, with CISA being a um, national cyber defense agency. Uh, so the goal for this conversation, discussion, questions is, I want to give you a brief overview of what it is that CISA is doing and why, motivation, um, big picture context, and also look at it through the lens of multiple uh, related activities with key touch points between each one of those activities and associated priorities. So with OSS being so prevalent, wildly used and driving the productivity and CISA being the National Cyber Defense Agency, naturally there is a role. Our mission, primarily our mission, is to understand, manage and reduce risk uh, to federal government, right? And critical infrastructure. And specifically mine is cyber. My mission that I support is cyber. And with open source uh, being used so wildly, it's one of the uh, areas where we need a stronger public-private sector partnership. So CISA must understand uh, the usage and must understand the prevalence and must understand the trustworthiness of what it is that federal sector is using. But also uh, the private industry is uh, facing the same challenges, right? Visibility in our own usage of OSS, management of uh, usage and contribution, production of OSS. So how do we uh, deliver, uh, ma manage OSS in a deliberate and um, uh, measured fashion. Uh, so OSS is a particular product without having actually a market, right? There's not a price, it's not a commodity. The developers are not being reimbursed, remunerated for um, uh, for what they're developing. So it's a market without money changing hands, right? It's not a commodity. It's a public good. Uh, if it's a public good, is there a role for a government? Absolutely. Some might say, look, if this is so prolifically used through the economy and driving the economy, safety and security is an inherently governmental function. True. Uh, and government has lowest cost of funding. Also, or cost of capital. Also true. However, um, what's the government's checkbook, right? It's taxpayers' money. It's your money. What's government's credit card? It's national debt. It's not just your money, but your kids' and grandkids' money. So how do we carefully engage and um, allow for requisite investment to drive, secure, maintain, or assess, and ensure the innovation that, that stems and value that stems from it without also in, um, doing it in a way that is irresponsible, uh, without uh, meddling with the equities. And it's a vibrant community, but there are multiple equities involved. And understanding the culture of the um, OSS ecosystem. So how do we responsibly invest where the most investment is warranted? Uh, so OSL scale and scope today, there are multiple studies that estimate how prolifically uh, OSS is used and how much value is derived in the economy. Uh, some of the estimates from Harvard, Harvard uh, Business School, that uh, there is a huge uh, value creation from OSS. Uh, if we were to estimate the demand side versus the value generated from its supply side, uh, four billion uh, is what about it costs uh, to generate OSS. Had uh, the authors, contributors, developers, maintainers being properly reimbursed for it. 
but the value derived from it is about eight trillion. And you'd say eight trillion, how much it is? Well, eight trillion happens to be about a third of the US GDP, right? US GDP from year to year is 22, 23, give or take. Uh, also, how many projects are out there? One of the metrics or uh, data points, there are at least 150 million of them hanging out on the GitHub, so significant presence. How is it used? Uh, we don't have a good visibility into it, however, working on understanding that. And it's not we federal government, it's all of us users don't have a really good understanding of direct dependencies on OSS or transitive, right, nested hierarchical dependencies on OSS. Uh, Black Duck, uh, so the report by Synopsys estimates that about 96% of code base contains OSS. Now it's an um, artifact of a particular data set or um, um, experiment design uh, analysis that's been done. But nevertheless, it still signifies um, the uh, prolific usage. And then um, we had a change in the culture where we went from, and I'll talk about it in a second, went from the uh, dot-com boom in 90s where OSS was not perceived as favorably, and now Linux is essentially driving Microsoft Azure. Uh, so we had a huge shift in the paradigm and prolific usage of OSS and uh, derived value from it. So again, how can o uh, CISA, uh, US government, get involved responsibly without trying to regulate and neither we should and frankly have no business doing that uh, and do it in a way that does not uh, do any harm. So preserving and respecting equities. Um, next slide would be here. So what is OSS? Uh, first and foremost, I mentioned it's not a product where money is changing hands. Uh, the development of it, uh, sharing of it uh, is not, um, um, it's valuable, but it's not necessarily compensated as if it was a market commodity. And it's also copyright of 1976 uh, established that it's um, creative work. And then further or later on in the 90s, uh, the point was driven home that's actually covered by First Amendment. It's freedom of speech, freedom of exp expression. Uh, and uh, the, the, these freedoms are baked in in the OSI compliant licenses uh, where uh, the four freedoms that you can use, you can study, you can share, um, and you can modify what you've shared and you can uh, share what you've modified. Uh, so the idea here is again to emphasize that OSS is used prolifically through different sectors of the economy. A lot of values derive from it. How can we responsibly get involved and understand what the appropriate role is? So step one is homework, right? Homework, understanding the cultural differences and the equities. And no presentation about software would be complete without beat up, tired crap. <laughs> so this is an example of, had it been, <laughs> for, had it been a dollar for every time this picture is used in, every, uh, in any um, different context, including out of context, somebody would have been a millionaire. But um, a couple of things, or th there's a tension with this. On the one hand, we have prolific use of OSS and value derivation from it. On the other hand, um, with the exponential growth of code and products out there, there is a limited amount of eyeballs dedicated to it. So yeah, given enough of the uh, eyeballs, all um, bugs could be fixed or all bugs are shallow. But also the color is true, that if there's not enough, then software is doomed to have all kinds of problems. And it's not good or bad, that's nature of existence. Anybody who's ever coded before, I dabbled, took myself off the streets, right? That would be a responsible thing to do at this point, but nevertheless, right? We have a natural rate of errors uh, per lines of code. That's a known. Uh, and then on the uh, other side of this is those that develop and contribute um, and produce um, open source. They have the time, but not the funding, not the capital to sustain uh, the, the rate of production and the quality associated with it. And then on the flip side, the companies, products, private sector, they're the ones that have the funding, the capital, but they're not the ones that have the time, and then there is a vicious product release cycle. So what, again, knowing that, what is government's role when we say OSS is prolific, it's used, value is derived, uh, what, what's there to do to ensure sustainable use, sustainable use of OSS in a safe and secure fashion. Um, and a cultural change or paradigm shift, Again, uh, all the buzzwords that could be used could be packed into three slides. Um, the shift where in the 90s and post-dot-com boom, OSS was looked down upon, right? It was something that you'd on a cheap garage project to fix in 
very tactical problem, uh, and often, depending on who the developer is, it could be an over-engineered solution to non-existent problem. So the range of opinions, nevertheless, that fundamentally shifted from a Microsoft looking down at OSS and denouncing it as a path forward um, to Microsoft fully embracing, Microsoft CEO fully embracing OSS. And those that have been at the uh, Seattle OSS Summit a couple of weeks ago, um, somebody mentioned kind of, it was a good joke, because at the same block, at the same time, Microsoft uh, was having their uh, corporate leadership meeting while we were having, uh, having OSS Summit. So had it been back in the 90s, that would be like trolling level 83, right? Where here now we have peacefully coexisting and developing products together. Uh, and um, the, uh, a lot of OSS being used and driving the innovation again. So with that uh, cultural shift, uh, how can federal government, CISA, uh, get involved without, again, doing any harm and while preserving and respecting equities in, in this um, environment eco ecosystem? So the idea was that whatever CISA does, A, we need to do our homework to understand how others see our role and most importantly or equally importantly to learn what it is that we should not do because we thought we had good ideas, then we better do the community and that was not necessarily, what we envisioned would be useful is not necessarily something that our partners in OSS ecosystem really wanted us to dabble in. Um, and the, the goal here has been that whatever we do, uh, we need to f foster an ecosystem, contribute to this ecosystem, make sure that it's secure, sustainable, and resilient, um, and we have a healthy and vibrant OSS ecosystem without, where CISA, where CISA could be a member, a contributing member, with the requisite um, investment being allocated properly. So here another, another aspect is, um, there is a perception or expectation, anticipation uh, that once the federal agency gets involved, then there is a level of control and regulation associated with it. And that's what we're trying to emphasize uh, through and through that this is not the case. This is where we know what the guardrails are. Uh, we know what the rules of engagement are. We've learned, we've been, we got learned, right? So uh, this is not in any way uh, the, ch uh, the opportunity for us to double in something where our presence is not welcome. We're very careful with whom we engage, how we engage, and try to preserve and respect the equities. So um, d as part of doing this homework and then trying to establish the programmatic direction, uh, in the uh, fall of last year, CISA issued OSS um, a roadmap, so open source roadmap, and it has four key pillars or goals. One is that, establish what CISA role can and should be. Uh, two is identify OSS usage and assess the risks. And I'll talk about that specific one in more detail because I happen to uh, be leading a couple projects uh, um, on this particular goal with Ava Black and uh, Jack Cable. And then goal three is reduce risk to the federal government because we're users, we uh, use OSS intensively. We we'll also contribute to it. I mean, our national labs, um, our national labs run on R and Python. That's just the uh, lay of the land. And then uh, the, nec the last one is based on everything we learn, uh, how we can prioritize activities uh, to maintain and secure OSS where we can harden um, the ecosystem. So goal one, it's, well, first and foremost, coordinate CISA's work with external parties, um, um, anyone from uh, uh, other agencies uh, that use uh, uh, and have a better programs, uh, having program offices associated with OSS and better management OSS, uh, and partner with key players and uh, thought leaders in the OSS community. Um, and also, the idea was that we would be able to maintain preserve the equities and be a place where we can convene and have multiple players, multiple leaders in this space um, openly discuss what the issues are, what the limitations should be. Um, and then external engagement, so it's OSS community itself, but everybody's in the industry who's using it, uh, or using any software, or the, uh, the usual supply chain discussion is, do we have, and that's not we, like federal government, it's this royal we of US economy that's 23 uh, trillion dollars per year. Do we have a good understanding of what devices are running where? The answer is no. IT, IT to OT, and OT, OT is like, organic English garden, stuff's growing, no one's mowing. So we do not have a good visibility there. 
do we have a good visibility, again, royal we, as to uh, what software is running on those devices? Uh, and the answer is again, oh, some, but not really, no. If you talk to uh, uh, DFERS, uh, Digital Forensics Incident Responders, or you talk to cyber insurance, they'll give you your you know, ear full as to who has what kind of understanding, what they're running, or what their crown jewels are, right? Business impact analysis, you'd think that somebody would be doing it to identify what their priority key, um, priorities or areas of concentration of focus should be. Nope, the fastest business impact analysis and most prolific business impact analysis is done after the incident had occurred. So that aside, so we said, we don't know what devices we're running, and it's not just we, right? It's national labs, for example, have better uh, view of uh, their own networks, uh, but there is a degree of opacity of software, and the software dependencies on that. How can we improve visibility? Uh, how can we understand what are the palatable courses of action here? And that's the identify the second goal, identify OSS usage and assess the risk. So I'm running a project there on understanding OSS prevalence, understanding OSS usage, and um, I'll go a little bit more in detail, but this one has emphasis on OT. Because we talked about IT, IT is a little bit more studied and represented in OT firmware at the, it's a zoo. And uh, while the vendors are working proactively on looking closer and deeper into what's being released now, newer versions, whatever is out there in the wild, that's uh, use at your own risk. Uh, so, uh, and I mentioned the word risk, so it's prevalence of what's being used, but it's also being able to overlay the criticality criteria, trustworthiness criteria, to understand what are the um, critical projects, libraries that support functionality of critical assets. So it's not just what's running there in the wild on a histogram, because uh, Microsoft, uh, but it's what it is that's running on critical assets supporting critical functions or mission essential functions if you're in the, in the federal government. And then assessing risks to FSEB, uh, um, so civilian uh, part of the federal government, and critical infrastructures where we can understand the potential areas for mitigation or mitigation recommendations. So it's targeted support of OSS uh, packages. And this is more of a strategic lenses. Once we overlay the trustworthiness criteria or criticality criteria on top of the prevalence, that inform the subset on which we need to focus, right? Where we need to dedicate a little bit more um, uh, of the investment. And investment could be in multiple forms. What is the most pal palatable one? That's also a TBD, right? Depends what we learn. So that's still exploratory surgery. And then a reduced risk to federal government. We have ability to offer shared services to other federal agencies. So you might have a more um, favorable uh, contracting terms, uh, pricing structure, but also having it uh, have do it in a consistent way such this information could be aggregated across federal uh, agencies and then the risk could be managed. So you have this visibility, but you have also aggregate data associated with the usage. Uh, also, uh, developing policies around OSS, so it's responsible use, responsible development, ensuring that whatever we do, we're doing in a sustainable manner with a deliberate and measured approach to, to managing it. And um, uh, the theme now, or we see it as a priority, uh, to help establish uh, open source program offices at federal agencies. For those of you that ever tried to establish a program office, uh, it's probably just as hard as getting the um, program or record going with the budgets allocation being in. Uh, but we have, uh, following, the present, following my uh, presentation, uh, we're gonna have a great talk uh, because I've seen some of these discussions before uh, from Remy, probably epitome of, yes, epitome of a deliberate and measured approach uh, to managing OSS usage in the federal agency. And we have some lessons learned, so thank you, sir, for everything you do. So, and the last one is the natural one, is whatever we learn, how do we give back to the community and do it in a way that's actually supported by the investment, right? So, uh, there are multiple things that could be done here. Uh, the most immediate one is a longer term adoption of memory safe languages. Um, another one is uh, software bill of materials and the part that's dear to my heart is the F-bomb, although I was told that firmware is software, so I should not use that. Nevertheless, firmware, right? That zoo where we have the degree of opacity that's not necessarily tolerable uh, for critical infrastructure. Um, and also another one, it is a longer term, uh, so it's increased education um, where we have secure by design principles baked into software development um, uh, curriculum. And this is something that is uh, not, 
It sounds easy, but it is a bit challenging because if you have accreditation requirements, those of you familiar, there's only so much you can do to tinker with the classes that are being offered. Uh, so it's including the uh, secure by design in the curriculum in a in di like dispersed fashion such that it does not uh, meddle with uh, what needs to be taught as core classes and elective classes um, and what it is. So I also happen to be on the industry advisory board uh, for cybersecurity engineering is what it is that our uh, potential employees, uh, employers, sorry, want to see in their employees coming out of the university. Therefore, um, including that in the curriculum is a really important, valuable long-term undertaking, but uh, there is a limited ability of what could be immediately done. Uh, so that's why we're working jointly on developing curriculum um, and also themes, seminars, applied topics that could be included in the existing pro programs under existing requirements. And then, of course, uh, coordination of disclosure of OSS vulnerabilities with XZ happening uh, recently. Uh, that's something where we have lessons learned. So this is OSS roadmap that CISA put out in uh, fall of last year looking at the time, uh, but since then, right, we've done the homework, we've defined our role, but we've been actively engaging with the OSS community and um, some of the examples, so these are ongoing collaboration uh, in support of OSS, examples, there's other work, but I'm naturally talking about the ones that I'm involved in, uh, have the best knowledge of. So uh, we've uh, worked with um, um, OpenSSF in uh, publishing principles for uh, package repository security. Um, and then we had uh, five repositories uh, committed at our OSS summit to adhere to those principles. So that's that's been um, a very positive development and we really encourage the partnership because we depend on the um, on the package repositories, they have a critical role in this en environment, in this ecosystem. Uh, so we had OSS Security Summit, and as part of the summit, so we've gathered everybody in one room for a day, and declared our priorities, uh, asked for input uh, and candid feedback, which we did receive, and then we had a tabletop exercise. And tabletop exercise had to do with um, responding to a hypothetical and timing, timing was fortunate. It was responding to a hypothetical compromise over a cr critical open source component. And something that we learned as part of that exercise is A, uh, lack of visibility into what software is running where and what that software depends on. So again, direct or transitive dependencies. Where is XZ? That was several weeks before XZ happened. Um, another aspect that we learned is, again, business impact analysis. It's not what depends on XZ Z or any other example, it's and which part of that is actually critical to your business operations. Um, that is that was not surprising. We kind of heard that, like I said, from geefers. We've heard that from cyber insurers. Um, it just drove the point home that it's not a dependency; it's a dependency where it matters. And then. Um, also, we have joint cyber defense collaborative, JCDC, uh, so they facilitate in real time information sharing uh, with OSS community. And when XZ happened, this particular partnership proven to be of a lot of value to multiple members of the community and federal agencies as well. So this is not only where GC JCDC sits on the side, there's real uh, information share, and this is, and when this happened recently, there was a very active role that they've taken, and we appreciate that. Um, so the, another example, or this is more of deeper dive into projects that I mentioned before, but OSS prevalence pilot, that's the one that has emphasis on OT, but IT is included. So if we divide our universe of federal, critical infrastructure, private sector, and then IT, OT, well, IT to OT, uh, connective tissue, and then operating system or below operating system. Federal IT is a little bit more better understood and we have programs in the space, uh, CDM being one of them. Uh, FSEB OT, opacity um, for multiple reasons and we're trying to ameliorate that. So the uh, pilot that we're working on is with national labs and full disclosure, it's not us writing code, it's using national labs and they've kindly offered their networks, their production networks and the tools that they were already running to see how we can stitch information um, about the devices that are running, software that are running, the subset that's critical because for that you need the lens of the owner and operator and then what, uh, which portion of that goes into software composition analysis, 
No, and you cannot do SEO out everything. So what's a prioritized subset? Versus how we can we get the dependency and uh, depth level information from other sources? So I've been very actively engaged with OSS community and uh, multiple analytic uh, firms uh, that do, um, uh, do this kind of analytics or have the data or have potential of going after the data. And we're partnering with the so uh, Science and Technology Directorate, also with the um, uh, Small Business Innovation and Research Funding uh, to develop some of these capabilities or boost some of these capabilities. So this is a 12, 18th, uh, 12, 18 month uh, project, uh, we are phase one into it. Uh, the idea is to have this common spec of, if we are after OSS dependencies, what are the data elements that need to be appended, for example, to SBOM multiple formats, and what it is that we need to be tracking in a meaningful way, that the information can go back to your, you know, RMS, Tenable, whatever it is that's been, Dragos that's been used for um, uh, uh, asset uh, management, asset discovery, identification management, and also vulnerability management. So this is where we have LANO, so Los Alamos, uh, Lawrence Livermore, and Pacific Northwest National Lab, and we pick them because of the combination of the tools that they already have on site. So we have a good coverage there. Um, and in conjunction with that, uh, we're also working with Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, Scott Hissom, uh, on developing a framework, 4P framework, for determining trustworthiness of various packages and um, uh, libraries. So 4P is project product, uh, than protection and policy, and multiple different dimensions where we want to assess that. So there are two versions of this framework floating around, and this is immediate call to action. This be on the lookout that's going to be published, a DOD version and a civilian version going to be published. A report will be a report with a full description of what to do and how to do it. Uh, should go public um, in the next couple of weeks. So this is DOD view of the world. Nevertheless, OSS is OSS. And on the next slide, I have the civilian view of the world. So project product protection policy, those are the dimensions that we want to look at or elements that we want to look at. So project is, um, that's the information about the project itself and organization or individuals associated with it. Um, then the product is also uh, what is the software surrounding the particular usage of the project. Uh, protection, what are the controls in place, both on the development um, side, but also on the uh, use side. And then the policies is uh, what are other stipulations that would impact the consumers. And it's again, consumers, but also developers. So the idea here is that uh, you have multiple, so these four, four P basis, and then you have multiple dimensions that you're looking at, such as long-term support, dependency, security, integrity, uh, malicious actors, and suitability, is it suitable for use? Uh, within each quadrant, there are specific markers that we're after. So when I say markers, it's not self-reported information. Is your package secure? Are you smart and beautiful? Yes to both. It's what are the automatable metrics, measures, indicators that we can look at using various tools uh, to get at the trustworthiness of uh, different um, L uh, components. Um, so that's a question usually comes up here. Is this, is this another scorecard? Well, we'll have a number. No, that's not the idea. The idea is really to establish the trustworthiness and metrics that are metrics, characteristics, factors, attributes, pick a word, how we can get after trustworthiness and do it in a way that's traceable and we have a continuity of doing this in time. Uh, so we can potentially observe evolution of some of the um, changes in trustworthiness. And here's a civilian, um, version of the same framework uh, where the, uh, the the bases are still four P's are the same project, product, uh, protection and policy, but the uh, factors that we're looking at are criticality, makes sense, right? So we're overlaying this on top of prevalence. So criticality makes sense, provenance, right? What is this project about? How it came to be? What's all baked in? Uh, reliability, security makes sense, integrity makes sense, suitability makes sense. So again, in each intersection or in each quadrant, you'll have particular markers, particular observables that you can work off of to assess the trustworthiness. So this uh, joint work with CMU SCI, um, Scott's report is going fully public unrestricted public uh, within the next couple of weeks. We we'll certainly would be sharing it with our community directly, but any of you that are interested, uh, please do take a look. So, and this is the, uh, this kind of ends the formal uh, portion of our planned programming is, yes, OSS is important. Yes, this is doing something about uh, having a meaningful support, maintenance, contribution, investment in the community and do it in a responsible fashion. I guess the emphasis is, 
there is a misconception that OSS is less secure than proprietary software. Um, that's up for debate. What OSS does that proprietary soft software does not offer you is a degree of transparency, right? So this is where if you need to, it's not like it's inherently less secure, but if you need to, you can have more eyeballs on the OSS. And if you need to, it could be your eyeballs. And we have a framework that when overlaid over prevalence or uh, overlaid on usage could help you identify which are the projects libraries that you depend on that might require more in-depth look, and also which are the projects and libraries that require more strategic programmatic support, whether it's orphanage, maintenance of end of life and support, uh, abandoned things, um, multiple, multiple ways of uh, going after securing OSS that's prolifically used by federal uh, sector and also critical infrastructure. Again, multiple equities baked in, careful way of not navigating them so we don't do any harm and we're respectful of the uh, creative and vibrant community that OSS is. Um, another aspect here is that the discussion of the uh, establishing programmatic offices or open uh, OSS offices within uh, different uh, departments certainly appreciate the predicament. It's, uh, it's a the formal process associated with it is not trivial. We understand that. But there are lots of things that could be done in the meantime up until that entity is formalized within the agency. So lots of ways of engaging, engaging with CISA, engaging with the community to be able to pursue some of these activities while the, um, the formalities of the office itself being figured out. Um, and <clears throat> I crawled out on stage in the premise of sharing best practices, like, oh, okay, what's going on? So, like, what CIS is struggling with is very, very representative of what the critical infrastructure and industry itself is struggling with. Lack of visibility, right? Lack of visibility into where, uh, what we're running where, and what depends on what we're running and where, right? So, critical functions, um, we have 55 critical functions, national critical functions that are very broadly defined, uh, but if we start drilling down in specifics, what are the entities of relevance? And keep in mind, CISA does not touch anybody's networks. We do, there's a misconception that we have the data that industry doesn't. That is not the case. We don't touch anybody's systems. And at best, what we can have is not individual and patient's data, but aggregate public health data for federal sector. We do not have that depth perception into the industry. Maybe we shouldn't. So it's one of those things where a truly meaningful public-private sector partnership is the only way that we can advance these gaps in visibility and um, have collaboration, meaningful collaboration about securing OSS, right? So uh, perspective, so this is the government perspective on offices and activities, but there's also perspective of um, um, OSS developers, maintainers, and repositories is that, yes, they're nonprofits, but they're not charities. They have very limited funding um, to, uh, to deal with very critical aspects of uh, uh, the products that they're supporting, projects and libraries they're supporting. And it's also not very fair to put a burden on them when it is the commercial use that derives so much value out of it, right? So it's not the burden of the developers and maintainers, um, it's the burden of those that, reasonable rational expectation that those that benefit from that value the most would have a proportional contribution back into the creation and maintenance of it. So how can we structure the relationship, again, preserving and respecting the equities, where these investments could be meaningfully allocated, uh, with the voice of the community being the front and center and decided what that looks like. So again, um, summary of the summary, CISA has a concerted effort in this space. Uh, the goal is sustainable use of OSS in safe and secure manner. And associated with that, there are a couple products that are immediate products for you. One, if you're aware of anyone who has better data on prevalence and use of OSS, I would welcome the connection. So you know how to find me. My profile is public to LinkedIn. I'd welcome that. <laughs> I'm not giving my cell phone number. <laughs> so that's one. And another one is for your own systems. Look at the trustworthiness framework. Look at how you are managing your use or managing of the development and contributions of OSS, right? And overlay that trustworthiness framework on both your development side or uh, maintenance side, but also your use side. So what's the meaningful, deliberate, measured approach to managing OSS, knowing how we um, depend on it through and through. 
Uh, that's that. I have about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I welcome any question except for the ones related to Circea. <laughs> Since the uh, notice of the proposed rulemaking is out, I can't comment on that in any shape or form. Anything else is fair game. Thank you. And uh, hey, thank you. That was a lot. And uh, I, I, th <coughs> I think in the, uh, uh, you know, you talked a lot about visibility, which is obviously critical and it's a hard problem, uh, especially for, you know, legacy things, OT. And I, I wonder, uh, since if you, you've gotten, um, you know, what happens after that? So GE, you know, we, we've been doing S-bombs for several years now, and what happens is, is you almost go to the opposite problem, right? You get the fire hose pointed at you. And, you know, we've gone to this point where we've, we've adopted, uh, uh, adjusted our processes where, you know, we automatically upgrade uh, so many of our things using tools like renovate, all this best practices, just to tr some of it, uh, not only just to keep us secure, but to keep the uh, keep down the size of the database we have to read through at the end, right? Um, because one of the things I see now is, uh, y you know, and I think people are not understanding well, certainly in operations, that a CVE and an incident aren't the same thing. And, you know, uh, there's a shortage of skills with, you know, people able to make kind of, for lack of a better term, grown up decisions about CVEs. You know, I'm a, a principal architect and I regularly get called from a customer. We, we found one, we found one. Tori, what do we do, what do we do? And, you know, I, I, are you seeing, it, I, I think a be, a, the, the, the next step of best practices is something I'm really looking for. Um, fair, so the, the again, not, I'm, not, I'm not the right spokesperson for a vulnerability disclosure, realizing that there's a lot going on in that space, but um, it's one of the issues that we're struggling with is uh, suffocation and alerts. We went from uh, encouraging data sharing so now we have TMI, right? That comes in the shape or form with high false positives, not anybody's particular fault. It's it's a preponderance of information. I'll be able to examine what's the depth or the evidence uh, to, to be able to make that decision as to which ones are, well, I, I can't use that example, <laughs> which ones are, um, are truly meaningful um, specimen that we need to focus our attention on. So. I don't, this is where, you know, I can pontificate about it five minutes and then have six different ways of not answering your question, just to recognize that it's a joint challenge. Uh, with the visibility, it's if we identify that something is an issue, can we get on after, like, I don't know, put something in the orchestrator and say, where is it? Right now, we don't have even that in um, um, automated, meaningful, you know, time frame uh, to be able to act on those that we know are true positives. Um, but I appreciate, I appreciate the predicament. Okay. Well, maybe I'll sneak one before Christopher gets down here. Uh, so another, I'm doing the yeah, th there's another thing we found is, and Grant, you're a security organization, so this makes a ton of sense. There's a tie, uh, what we found between, you know, the visibility that comes with this, there's the security side, there's also a huge compliance side. So most people don't actually comply with the open source licenses. And we've been using it as a bootstrap for making sure we're doing all the reporting the licenses say in the fine print. And we had to build, we found the S-bombs aren't enough for that. We had to roll a bunch of our own in order to do it properly. And I don't, I, I don't know, I guess my question is, is, is there, or is this something you're aware of? Is, is there anything we, because we're solving the same problem from different. Okay. Well, since yeah. we're venting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, there is a recognition of that, that acknowledgement themselves is not a trivial burden, right? Uh, and I'm not a counsel and I'm certainly not your counsel, but yes, and that's where we wanna have a meaningful dialogue with, with the multiple players in ecosystem saying what we should not do, what are the known problems? They're not new, they're just new to us. How can we harvest that knowledge? And then whatever the subset that CISA can act on is gonna be meaningful and helpful, uh, not another compliance regime where we add additional burden on tracking what you don't see. Um, uh, another aspect of it, and I fully, what you mentioned earlier about a CVEs, I see it in a different, um, it manifests itself differently. Um, sharing, oversharing versus TMI. Some of the basic things, not to harp on any particular agency, but 
software naming convention, right? If I dump everything that's running the federal government now, deduped, just guess, guess what's the number of entries is in this data set? Just like guess, a bit of trivia. Um, I'm standing up here, so uh, 2,000, 20,000? What, <laughs> what for the number of apps? I don't know. 177, 176 million. That's deduped data set. What if I use Mendio or any other tool that's out there tells me what's baked into the, what open source software is baked into the uh, software? So now I have to go through 176, many to map. No. So yeah. there, there, are the, there are problems of tractability. That said, back from math, how do you solve infinitely dimensional problem? You reduce it down to the common least complex subproblem, right? So if I were to reduce it, like Bickle and Sickles, 1971, if I were to reduce it down, naming convention being the zoo of itself that needs to be addressed, public-private sector partnership is needed because we can come up with the standards and compliance regimes, uh, you know, at nauseum, but if they're burdensome to comply with, they're not going to be adopted and followed, right? So this is the same uh, being of uh, regulatory work, uh, not to mention any specific one, just in general, uh, whatever you do uh, has to be done at the level that's available to the industry, otherwise what you're going to get is you've got a compliance with regime with crappy level of compliance and no enforcement, right? So that's where this did. Uh, uh, but also, it's like, so that's one sub problem, naming convention. Another one is this trustworthiness framework is what are the attributes of factors that we should consider to be able to say, what is this thing? Like, how worried should I be about it? And then how prevalent is it? So it's not prevalence itself, and it's not just the criticality, because it's a combination of the two where, again, the cross map is partly naming convention. So I'm not necessarily answering your question directly, but like I said, since we're quetching, it is an issue that would require more than a you know, single year partnership, but meaningful partnership, public sector, uh, private sector partnership, because neither, no agency can solely themselves, and that's not where the industry can uh, go it their own, and it's not necessarily the burden that open source community should or can carry. No, 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 no. I, I, I have a brief question. I, um, could you maybe opine on uh, identity of these open source developers and how that could factor into the, the trust matrix? That specifically, anyone could get into GitHub account, right? But getting a login.gov account requires some uh, affiliations. Uh, and I wonder if there's a role to play for your office or some other office to say, you know, or, or, a, or a professional association to say, you know, this is a known entity, this is who they know, and the, 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 the person bomb, if you will, of the open source profile? It's a contentious uh, question for the following reason. If OSS is uh, um, creative expression and freedom of speech, how would anybody feel about government trying to establish the personas behind the development maintenance or contributions? Um, and if we push, not push, um, expand on this dis discussion and include uh, international sensitivities associated with that, that might not necessarily be appropriate role for a government whatsoever. Because I think this is where do no harm, one of those aspects where government involvement might not be helpful. What kind of a, what kind of a trustworthiness indicators or proxies, right, latent, ver latent variable, what kind of proxies we can have to understand um, but this is not where, based on the feedback from the community, this is not where government should have a role. Um, I don't have a yes or no answer to that. It is one of the very, very sensitive areas of engagement because of everything that OSS is, how that community evolved, and what the community represents. So we need to be very careful on respecting those equities without infringing on the privacy of those that are developing it or maintaining. Just to add on that a little bit, so from the Linux Foundation, uh, we think a lot about reputation. Uh, so not necessarily like, you know, you can have a reputation while still main, maintaining anonymity. Uh, and, and one example, uh, you know, a different example from, from Linux is uh, in order to become a maintainer, you actually have to physically swap keys with another maintainer in person. So there, there's that example from the Linux community. Now that's not every open source project, 
but there are different ways of getting that sort of reputation. Um, and then I would agree, you know, having in an international open source context, having the US government play a role in establishing identity probably would limit collaboration. Well, and uh, if I may add, this is where um, uh, there is a critical role that repositories and project themselves and maintainers, um, foundations can play where government could support with funding, but not meddle in the troll information being shared, right? So this is something that is left for the ecosystem to manage and self. It's not regulate, it's really self-organize and bring that level of quality, trustworthiness, transparency, but up to the point at which it becomes prohibitive or there is even a perception of the loss of the privacy. Any other questions? Or do I, I think this is the time where I should get a hook and I can leave voluntarily, <laughs> but sir, <laughs> your show. <laughs> oh. I think that's that. Yeah, so. thank you.